Okay, next up is the Liliaceae, not surprisingly known as the Lily family. Some dominant characteristics of the Liliaceae, they are monocots, which means uh, we expect them to have those parallel leaf veins. There are a few oddballs in the group that have some netted leaves, but they still manage to qualify as a lily on the other characteristics they have. And of course the flowers are in threes and multiples of three. The roots are usually bulbs, that specialized underground storage organ that has a extremely reduced root at the very bottom and storage in fleshy leaves. Think tulips and onions. Sometimes there are rhizomes, which are underground roots, again, the storage organ. The seeds are generally dispersed by wind or animals, and the fruit is a capsule, a specialized type of fruit. And some species are mildly poisonous to animals, generally cats and dogs and domesticated things that um, should probably know better than to eat daylilies, but occasionally, apparently, they do. Typical lily flowers, again, parts in threes or sixes. The uh, many, many lilies, the sepals, which you've learned are the green little modified leaves that are at the base of many flowers, are actually uh, elongated uh, to be, in many cases, indistinguishable from the petals. Sometimes the colors are different than the petals, but they end up adding to the showy aspect of the flower. And the powers that be in the botanical word have decided on a Brangelina kind of word called tepals to indicate those types of combo flowers. The stigma is, of course, in uh, three parts. The capsule is three-celled, and nothing too unusual about the anthers and the filaments. The anthers do generally, uh, the combined stamen does generally extend quite a ways beyond the petals, as a general, uh, beyond the tepals, excuse me, as a general rule. Here's our evolutionary tree again. So I've uh, circled the Liliales on the left in red, so you can see where this uh, group of plants lies in the plant evolutionary world. The Whenever a plant uh, taxonomic word ends in ales, A-L-E-S, uh, that indicates an order. Orders are a step up taxonomically uh, from, plant, from the plant families, the ACA. So the Liliales will include other plant families in addition to the lily ACA. But at any rate, this picture shows you how these, uh, these guys rank up against the rest of the world with the monocots below the dicots, but again, uh, above water plants and ferns and things like that. A little bit more taxonomy. They're, of course, in the kingdom plantae. They're angiosperms, they're monocots, they're lily ales, lily ACA. Over 280 genera which is pretty good size. Uh, many plant families have considerably less than that, although of course some have more. Right now there's a huge fuss among the plant taxonomists of the universe because this family used to be far, far larger and there is a move afoot to break it into numerous other families. If you look on the Wikipedia page it has a list of of species that used to be in the Liliaceae that are no longer and you just about have to hunt for those in bold that actually are still in the Liliaceae. So things like garlic and onions, amaryllis, asparagus, hosta, trillium, that used to be in the Liliaceae are no more. And I probably will cover some of those other families because some of those plants have an enormous impact on mankind, or mankind has an impact on them. It depends on how you look at it. So uh, we'll cover those in some, at some future point. Some of them have uh, some interesting poisons too, which makes them all the more interesting to talk about. So notable species that are still left in the Liliaceae, there is lily, which uh, Latin name is lilium, the mariposa lily, beautiful flower from the mountains along the glacier lily, uh, mountain areas in western U.S. predominantly, fairy bells, delicate little, little flowers in the Midwest, tulips, which have um, huge uh, economic and um, aesthetic value to uh, the universe, as do daylilies. So uh, these in general, there's a lot of uh, houseplants, floral species, and uh, things that are important to the horticulture industry. Here are some pictures, both to show you typical lily flowers and just uh, some of the interesting genera. Mariposa lily is on the left. I actually took that picture in uh, Glacier National Park. These are just beautiful spring wildflowers. Almost always have an interesting collection of little flies on them that are obviously attracted to something about that flower. 
when you take a look at it, you can imagine it might have some of those uh, UV colorings, uh, bullseyes that we were seeing in that TED talk the other day. And again, parts and threes. In this one, the sepals are not so similar to the petals. Uh, as on the right, you've got a lily, which there are, this is our typical Easter lily. The um, huge white tubular flowers, and in this case, they definitely the sepals are pretty much indistinguishable from the petals, so those would definitely be tepals. And you can see that parallel leaf veinage in there too, along with the protruding anthers. Tulip, huge member of the family. Tulips are um, iconic spring flowers, uh, part of the economy of many large areas of the universe. And on the left, you can see a variegated tulip, which I will talk about a little bit more in the next couple slides. Historically, there was great interest in these variegated tulips because they were considered very attractive. The variegation actually was caused by a virus, which was causing the, the tissues in the petal and the sepals there to be unable to produce the color that they are genetically programmed to. And the virus actually weakened the plants, so they were not especially desirable as far as being robust tulips, but they were very attractive. Today, most of those viruses have been sort of um, weeded out, and plants are actually bred for that variegation, so it's not a, a disease condition. Daylily is another big, uh, a common member of the, the a, a large member of the family. In this case, you can see the difference in the sepals and the petals. Uh, in color, but they still do add to the overall um, flower aspect. On the right, lower right, you can see a flower garden of uh, selections of different types of daylilies. There are literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of types of daylilies that have been bred and selected for a huge range, some of it for being ruffled, sometimes for having long and skinny petals. I was in a talk one time where somebody was going through all their, their catalog of types of daylilies, and it was pretty much endless. And some of them you wouldn't even consider attractive, but they're very difficult to obtain, so because they're rare, they have value to some people. Fairy bells, I think wonderfully named. This is another photograph I took at Glacier National, uh, the little fairy bells hanging down there. And uh, again, an example of the sepals and the petals looking very similar, ex protruding stamens and anthers. And I left a little bit of the leaf in the right side of the picture so you could see the parallel veins in this species also. At the upper right, uh, sort of center of the picture, you can see uh, flowers that have, they're done blooming. You can see two protruding off the top of that center, center flower where the, the petals have fallen off and the fruit is beginning to develop into a little capsule there. Tulip mania occurred in 1937 in the Netherlands. The tulips had just sort of gotten to the Netherlands at this point in time. Tulips are actually uh, historically from kind of a bullseye on Turkey in the Middle East, although there are some species that actually are over in China and other areas of uh, Western Asia. Uh, however, they had been uh, hybridized and um, selected for and, and been creeping through Europe in the 1600s, and by 1637, there was a huge interest in them in the Netherlands. And uh, in particular, because there just was no flower like this uh, common in the Netherlands. They, of their wildflowers, other flowers that they had, this was just so unique that it was so eye-catching that there was enormous interest in it. And again, you can see the variegation on this uh, picture that's shown here. That's the Semper Augustus, which was a drawing made in that era. The, those, that species is, or that uh, variety is no longer available because of the issues with the virus. But this was so prized that it's said that one bulb sold for as much as 10 times the annual wage of a skilled laborer. That has been challenged a little bit by some historians, but it's definitely uh, the case that it was a huge status indicator, in, indicator for the rich, not just in Netherlands, but in the other European countries. And, uh, but that there was a huge uh, fluctuation in prices of, this, uh, of these tulips in the mid-1630s. And it's been called the first economic bubble that when um, the value, the intrinsic value of something becomes separated from what it's selling for. So, you know, people are going crazy over something and paying far more than it's worth. And whether or not it was the official actual 
sanctioned by the banking industry as yes, the official first economic bubble. It was very case, very much the case that something happened economically, and then they, the value crashed. And so now, uh, in today's vernacular, people talk about tulip mania as uh, an indication of uh, an economic bubble. So that has entered our our dictionary, whether the exact accurate uh, descriptions of it. It's long enough ago that it's hard to know exactly what happened. The Ottoman Empire in the later years uh, into the 1700s uh, sort of was a similar thing. The uh, Having a lot of tulips was definitely a status indicator if you wanted to show people you were rich. Here's a few native Iowa, uh, Iowa native lily family members. Uh, this is the dogtooth violet, is what it's commonly called in Iowa. It's not a violet. Where I grew up in Michigan, it's called adder's tongue, which just shows you how much um, uh, relying on the names of common names of plants uh, will really help you. Latin name is Erythronium americanum. Very, very common in woodlands in the Des Moines area. Sometimes the flowers are not as yellow as those. They're more sort of um, paley white. You could almost imagine a little pink in them, but they do have that same structure and the leaves are quite distinctive. Wood lily is a good prairie species, not all that big, maybe 15, 18 inches tall. And uh, it has this beautiful orange flower on it that that's not the product of uh, any kind of man genetic manipulation or selection. That's just how it came to us. And the Michigan lily is also native to the state. It has large bouncy flowers on it. This one is growing in someone's garden. They're challenging to grow in your garden because there's just about nothing deer-like better than to nip off those buds. Just you watch that in your garden for weeks, and then just when it's ready to open, all of a sudden they get all nipped off. But somehow this is a deer-proof garden where they were able to uh, produce this showy, showy show. I mentioned toxicity. They're not uh, horribly poisonous, and in particular, it's it's felt that they're fairly bitter, and so the chances of anybody or like a child uh, eating much of them are, are fairly low. Uh, they're even one of the stories with the tulip mania that presumably some guy got put in jail because he ate somebody's tulip thinking it was an onion. That's challenged in that it's uh, harsh enough tasting that it would be hard to imagine that somebody would, would accidentally eat the whole thing. But there is the occasional cat's horse, dog, cow that uh, manages to eat enough to cause a little um, indigestion. So for more information, if you're interested, of course, the Wikipedia, Wikipedia page is always a good, uh, interesting place to start. There's many, many, many other references out there. If you want to spend a lot of time looking at all the fuss over what's exactly a lily and what isn't, um, feel free. There is a North American Lily Society of people that are interested in the, the cultured lilies. Obviously, these would be the horticultural and the floral people. And interestingly, the Iowa Regional Lily Society is going to host the North American Lily Society annual meeting in Des Moines this June. So if you want to meet uh, some of those people or just know more about lilies, there's an opportunity for you. So that will conclude our Lilyaceae study.